Hello and welcome to my easy to understand guide to representation in Huck Magazine. Huck Magazine is an optional magazine text for component two on the A-level media studies exam. Some schools study other magazines so please be aware this video might not be relevant to you but if it is I do have this video on representation and I have got other videos either already on my channel or coming up soon on my channel for both Huck and Women's Realm to cover things like media language, audiences and industries. With these magazine texts, whatever magazine your school is doing, they're quite long. There's a lot of pages that you're going to need to remember that you will not have access to in the exam. If you take a look at the front cover first, the front cover is always a good place to start. Have a think about how um, the person on the front cover is represented. So you have a female fighter, um, a, quite unconventional just to start with to have a female fighter. She's dressed in army fatigue. She's got a gun, so she's armed. She's got quite a serious body language and facial expression. Quite unconventional, whereas a lot of magazines, depending on the genre, often represent women in much more feminine ways um, or sexualized ways. So to have somebody who is clearly being shown in a very powerful, dominant position, um, you know, potentially seeing them as, uh, as somebody who will use violence if needs be, um, is quite unconventional for, um, for the representation of women in general. We are seeing her as quite isolated because we're seeing this long shot with lots of space around her. She's quite loosely framed. And that means that she does seem quite alone. It doesn't look like she's got lots of makeup on. Her hair is kind of bunged up in a ponytail. It doesn't look particularly photoshopped, which is what conventionally happens on many magazines. So it feels like quite a realistic representation. But you do have to be aware that there is always mediation and construction and manipulation that goes into every media product. So whilst it may look or feel realistic to an audience, it doesn't necessarily mean it is. There's a quote at the top of the page which says, uh, we live in a world where women are dominated by men. We are here to take control of our own future. So the actual quote on the front is addressing this idea of feminism and the need to fight against a patriarchal society. Um, it's, it's portraying women as needing to stand up and, and fight back. Um, to protest and to deal with the situation that they are in. Might tie in with the fact that their strap line for the magazine is the defiance issue. You know, if something is defiant, it is rebellious or different or alternative. It goes against the norms. It's challenging. Um, and they are the general ideologies of Huck magazine. And you can see those ideologies affecting the representations in all of the rest of the pages as well. On the front cover as well, they mention both men and female artists um, from different genres and different eras, but that those the artists they choose to mention or the things they choose to mention create representations. You know, the choice of David Bowie, who um, was known for kind of bending a lot of the rules to do with gender as an artist. You know, he wore makeup, um, he wore um, kind of stretchy lycra costumes back in his kind of glam rock days. Um, and he wasn't afraid to, to bend those kind of gender norms and expectations. Uh, mentioning the band Pussy Riot, so if you do some research into this band, they are a kind of feminist girl band who are known for protesting against kind of patriarchal systems. And, um, you know, they've got into quite a lot of controversy in the past for standing up against misogyny, um, sexism. Um, you know, they even stood up to Vladimir Putin at one point. So, um, you know, the quite powerful women who are challenging society. You could also have a think about ethnicity as well as gender. Um, you know, if you think about typical stereotypes to do with ethnicity, particularly if we're talking about cultures from any countries in the Middle East, um, where there's often this association with things like aggression uh, or crime, terrorism, fighting, war. Um, and this actually does reflect a lot of those stereotypes. We're seeing a woman from a Middle Eastern culture, although it's not entirely clear from the front cover what country she is from, um, but being represented in quite an aggressive way. Um, and so, you know, perhaps conforming to some ethnic stereotypes, but maybe challenging some female stereotypes. And then if you look at those two things together, ethnicity and gender, if you think about bell hooks and the idea that she thinks that gender and ethnicity are intrinsically linked, thinking about how challenging it is to show a woman from Middle Eastern countries as a female fighter, you know, that's particularly unconventional and alternative um, because we often think of women being um, subservient or dominated um, in those particular kinds of countries. 
in the G-Star Raw advert, which is a double page advert, um, you get quite androgynous uh, representations of men and women. Androgynous basically means that there's very little difference between the male and female representations, and they're kind of represented as somewhere in between. And this isn't anything to do with their gender identity, really. It's more to do with their their style and the, the often to do with the way they look. So if we describe someone's look as androgynous, it's that idea that it's not really particularly masculine and it's not really particularly feminine. Um, so, you know, or both the male and female people within the adverts are wearing very similar outfits, the jeans, the leather jackets, the sunglasses and the boots. So it's a very, you know, they're, they're represented in a very similar way. They're not binary in terms of their gender. The editor's letter, which is the one that references Capture in the Rye, um, is quite good at representing the ideologies of the magazine. There's lots of stuff in there about defiance. The reference to Capture in the Rye is um, very interesting because that whole book is about defiance and rebellion and being different and standing out. Um, and it's also a very controversial book as well. It's got a very controversial history. So, um, you know, referencing things like that, referencing punks and uh, anti-Putin uh, groups and feisty kids, and they talk about freedom fighters and resistance, uh, brave people and heroes. The whole editor's letter, that whole double page, is very good at clearly representing the ideologies of the magazine that they are going to be a magazine that is defiant, alternative, different, challenging, unconventional. The Ossalam's Angels article is very long um, and I appreciate there's a lot of writing on it but it would be very useful to read it, go through it, highlight it, make some notes about how women are represented, how men are represented, how people from these particular countries uh, are represented or these particular ethnicities um, because you are going to need to be able to pick out specific examples. Just like the front cover, you've got lots of images of women dressed in kind of army or military style outfits, fatigues, lots of weaponry, which makes them seem very powerful and aggressive and strong, very much like a kind of typical hero character challenging those conventions of gender. They've called them Ossalam's angels, and we often think of angels as being feminine, um, and it does make them sound quite good. Uh, so it kind of representing them perhaps as being angelic, heroic, like they're doing good work. Um, although it's interesting to note that the reason they're called Ossalam's angels is because there's a man in charge of the group uh, with the surname Ossalam. So it kind of makes it sound as though there's ultimately a man in charge and he just kind of owns and and orders around the women and they kind of do his um, bidding, if you like. And that is obviously more conventional of gender. If you have a look at some of the quotes from the article, um, there are several female um, people, female fighters that are quoted in the interviews and in the articles, talking about how they've killed people, how they murdered them outright, um, and sounding quite proud of the fact and, and quite happy about what they've done. So it's really representing women in quite an aggressive, dominant, almost violent or murderous uh, way. The article makes it really clear that these people are feminists and that they are fighting a patriarchal system. It mentions several times that, um, you know, they were told that fighting and that politics were no girl's business and that they are standing up to this patriarchal system. So it makes it very clear that they feel like what they're doing is a feminist protest. It's important to have a think about how biased the article is. Like, is it saying that this is a really positive thing and that these people are really amazing people? There definitely are some positives, you know, calling them someone's angels, you know, putting these quite strong images of them and talking about how they are fighting patriarchy. It does make them sound like they are doing the right thing and that they are the kind of heroes in the situation. But it's not all positive representations. We do see um, parts of the article talk about women that have died, young women that have lost their lives, their grieving families. Um, and so suggesting that perhaps these particular women aren't necessarily doing the right thing. There's a few quotes from families talking about how they feel as though this particular group, the Ossalans Angels, are almost like a cult uh, that have brainwashed young women. Um, and it does make it sound quite negative in parts. So the article represents the Ossalans Angels and this particular group in both positive and negative ways. And perhaps that is reflective of Huck magazine. Perhaps they're not trying to get an audience to take the kind of preferred reading or a preferred reading. They're leaving it up to more open to interpretation and, and asking their audiences to come up with their own opinions and form their own conclusions. 
Again, much like the front cover does, this article challenges a lot of society's expectations about ethnicity, race and culture. This idea of, um, you know, the typical expectations of societies in, in Syria is that uh, we often think of women being oppressed in communities like that or women being weak, vulnerable, needing to be protected, subservient, not being given freedom. Whereas we are seeing that these women fighting for freedom, standing up, being, you know, doing very aggressive uh, powerful jobs that take a lot of strength and determination. And so the article challenges quite a lot of our expectations about race and ethnicity as well. Perhaps this also appeals to the audience who we often think of as being quite open minded, quite liberal, left wing and also quite global. Huck is quite popular around the world um, and is known as featuring lots of global stories. So the audience would probably want some quite positive stories um, about people from different communities. The Teenage Utopia article tackles gender, age and ethnicity. So it's worth having a look at all of those things. We often think of the typical stereotypes of teenagers as being kind of lazy or layabouts, you know, not, you know, focusing on education, focusing more on entertainment. And I guess the idea that these guys are all skating um, in their spare time might reflect some of those stereotypes. But in other ways, it's very challenging. It talks it does imply in the article that within Brussels, teenagers are the ones leading the way in terms of challenging all these um, kind of typical assumptions about ethnicity, culture, immigration, age. So um, it talks about the teenagers getting together and, um, you know, sharing their ideas and, and working as part of a community. It talks about people from all different cultures. And indeed, we see people in the images, you know, some people wearing headscarves, some people not, male, female, slightly younger, slightly older. So we're getting a real diverse representation of people within the article, with the implication being that they're all friends, a part of one big community, and that that is perhaps challenging some of the expectations around young people people from diverse backgrounds within Brussels. The article actually directly addresses some people's um, kind of racist assumptions or xenophobic assumptions about them because of their race or ethnicity. Some of the people interviewed talk about the assumptions people make about them being terrorists. And so the article is trying to tackle some of those kind of very current social cultural issues. In that Teenage Utopia article, they offer lots of explanations for things like teenage crime, teenage radicalisation. So they talk about how positive young people can be and they give examples of some great things young people have accomplished. But they also talk about the reasons. So they, they talk about things like lack of funding. They talk about boredom. They talk about adult like decision makers, like politicians, um, you know, not giving people the opportunities, not, you know, giving people enough education. So it's kind of representing older people as being potentially responsible for any problems that young people um, either suffer from or, um, you know, maybe commit themselves. Um, and in general, it's representing young people in a really positive light, but tackling and showing understanding that, you know, young people often aren't represented that way in other media products. The GoPro advert is perhaps more traditional in terms of gender at the very least. You've got kind of quite a masculine looking muscular man uh, surfing, kind of doing extreme sports, perhaps more typical representation of gender here. Although it is somebody who looks like they're from an ethnic minority background. Um, so the inclusion of these diverse people from a range of different ethnicities and cultures, you know, is just goes to show um, the diversity that maybe Huck magazine wants to include. Um, and, uh, you know, again, that is quite unconventional. We often think of um, diverse ranges of ethnicities being unrepresented or misrepresented in a lot of other media products. The Beyond Binary section um, in Huck has two separate articles about two separate individuals. So we have Jacob Tobia and Arabia Felix. Whereas many media products, in particular magazines, often represent gender in a binary way. So very like masculine and feminine being completely opposite. Um, and, you know, the idea that men are very different to women and that there are certain things that are masculine and certain things that are feminine. Whereas Huck magazine, and in particular in this beyond binary section, are representing gender in a, in a less binary fashion. So showing that there aren't um, there aren't um, behaviours that 
are just for men and just for women. They're showing a more diverse, complex representations. So we get a kind of um, quote at the top that says gender uh, looks boring in just pink and blue. These people push beyond the binary. So clearly making it obvious in that very first part of the article um, that this is going to be about, uh, you know, tackling those binary stereotypes of gender. And Jacob Tobia, it's important to look at um, the wording and uh, the way they talk about themselves. Jacob Tobia um, refers to themselves as being somebody who is uh, non-binary or gender neutral um, and even uses the phrase, uh, uh, the phrase gender queer. Um, so that means that they um, do not necessarily identify as like male or female, it's more that they, um, you know, perhaps see themselves as as somewhere in between, or wanting to use and embrace both masculine and feminine qualities, whether that's in terms of costume, makeup, behaviours, actions, attitudes, whatever it might be. Um, they also use um, the they pronoun, um, and it says somewhere in the article that um, they use the uh, MX pronoun, um, so uh, instead of like Miss or Mrs or Mr, MX is considered to be a reasonably gender neutral um, label for people to use. So um, Jacob Tobia, we get this amazing picture, very bold um, picture where we are seeing like typically female um, attributes like the makeup and the earrings and the necklace and the lace and the fur, but with quite traditionally masculine appearances of sort of stubble, um, you know, a kind of uh, semi beard moustache going on. Um, and so it's it's the juxtaposition of these images, which is quite interesting and maybe quite controversial or dramatic for many audiences. And it's it's certainly very bold and engaging. They talk about living in Brooklyn. They talk about growing up as a child, um, you know, playing with dolls um, and trying to accept that um, they identified perhaps more in a, in a more feminine fashion than a male fashion. They talk about how difficult this was growing up in terms of their family and their friends and teachers um, and, you know, getting their nails uh, polished for the first time. Um, and it, it's really interesting to read about these um, these activities and performances that J Jacob Tobia goes through on a day to day basis that help them to construct their own idea of gender. And if you've looked at Judith Butler's gender performativity theory, it's that idea that perhaps Tobia is performing certain actions like the makeup and the earrings and the clothing in order to construct their own gender identity. Um, if you're not sure about Judith Butler's gender performativity theory, I do have a whole separate video on my channel about that theory, so please check that out. Arabia Felix, on the other hand, um, identifies as male, uh, uses male pronouns, but um, considers themselves to be a kind of drag queen uh, makeup artist. He mentions about how difficult it has been growing up in Kuwait, um, but that he mentions how difficult it would be growing up in, in other places, you know, how much worse his life would be if he was growing up in, in somewhere like Saudi Arabia, for example, that have much stricter ideas about gender. Um, so the article itself is kind of representing gender in quite a progressive, modern way. Arabia Felix also talks about the performance he puts on when he dresses as a woman. So the use of the makeup and the nails and stilettos and, and how that makes him feel different ways about his gender and his identity. He also tackles the idea of religion and how that also might affect the way that he is seen by his uh, community. Um, so, you know, perhaps representing gender as being something that whilst it is more progressive and accepted in a more liberal fashion in many places, perhaps again, not just in terms of countries and cultures, but religions, um, you know, might affect the way that gender is seen. Um, so, you know, people from different religious backgrounds might have different views about gender. The photo as well, again, as well as being very bold and very kind of artistic with the bold lipstick and the bright yellow, it's quite a sad looking photo. And the same with the um, Jacob Tobia one. Um, both Tobia and Felix look, um, you know, a little bit sad, a little bit serious, perhaps connoting the difficulties that they face in terms of gender um, and sexuality for, um, you know, in some circumstances. So um, in general, Huck magazine, and in particular, this section is representing gender 
in a in a less binary way, in a more diverse, complex way, almost like a pick and mix where you can you can choose what your identity is about. And in general, the magazine as a whole has got quite diverse representations of women and of men, diverse representations of ethnicity, pretty diverse representations of age. And so in general, this magazine and the, certainly these set pages show Huck as being a magazine that is quite liberal, quite open minded, quite diverse and perhaps very different, therefore, from a lot of mainstream magazines that tend to be um, less diverse, less uh, open minded um, about things like gender, sexuality, um, etc. So that is my video about representation in Huck magazine. It's worth also having a look at the Huck website as well as some of their maybe their YouTube videos, their Instagram posts, um, just to get an idea as to whether those kind of diverse, open minded representations are evident in all of their other media products as well. Um, and just remember that it is very reflective of their, their kind of liberal left wing audiences um, millennial audiences, the fact that their magazine and the company is quite a, a left-wing, open-minded, liberal organisation, that they're an alternative niche magazine. Um, so there are definite reasons for the way they represent people.